Hi everyone, welcome to our latest podcast today. It's a special one. We're going to be talking about transfers. That's all it's about. I've got Sharky with me and we're going to just be talking about, you know, Newcastle's dreadful January transfer window and the Rafa Benitez's future, the board and the players that came in, the players that didn't come in and uh, the players that we, d- we couldn't sell, that all were loaned out. Right, so we're going to take you back to um, earlier on in the month, you know, this takeover that didn't actually occur. Uh, I was personally frustrated. Shorty, what were your thoughts on the takeover that didn't actually happen? Well, it was to be expected. I mean, at the start of October, that's when the news broke out that Newcastle were potentially going to get bought out. And then there was talk of Christmas that the deal was going to be there and that by January, Newcastle would have some money to spend uh, this month. Then we got told around Christmas time that wasn't happening and that wasn't the case. And then obviously January, the, the final news came out that we weren't getting bought out and then it's back to reality with Mike Ashley, isn't it? And uh, the fans can only dream for another day really do you know I I said at the time that the takeover not going through it could be a good thing because we'll actually mean that Rafa knows where he stands with transfers Um, because I think if the takeover had carried on we wouldn't have seen with three loan players come in personally so I think in the long term we don't know what's going to happen with the takeover does Amanda Stavely come back in for her I think she will me do you what do you reckon I think she'll come back in before the end of the season or do you think it's completely gone I'm on the opposite side. I think it's completely gone now. I think, you know, that the offer's there. She's offered £250 million for the club. Mike Ashley wants 300 Is she going to really offer the extra £50 million? Well, that remains to be seen. Mike Ashley is stubborn. You know what he's like as, a, as an owner. He wants more money for what he's paid for anything. And it's, it's Mike Ashley. You know, we'll have to expect it. You know, he's been there for 10 years. He's not really invested heavily in the club. Yes, he's kept with Flo. I, I totally get that. We've had two relegations. You know, we've had one of the best managers that we've, we could possibly ever have since Bobby Robson and Kevin Keegan and Rafa Benitez. He's been messing around, obviously, uh, over the summer. And then talking of this window, you know, he was expecting money. Um, it's going to be it's going to be interesting uh, to see what happens in the summer now and what happens with with Rafa Benitez. What happens with the ownership uh, going forward? Yeah, I actually think I think they should come back in. Me, I don't think we've heard the last of it. So let us know on that. Right. So the board, you know, the boards. You look at the January transfer window, and I know we'll talk about the players in a moment, but the boards. I think James said it on a, on one of the fan cams that Lee Charney, does he know how to negotiate? And I just. They, they just can't get players over the line, you know? what? It's not just this transfer window. We've seen it, you know, in August we couldn't get Southampton's reserve left back, Matt Target, signed for it. And then. In the previous month, January, we went in for Townsend again as well. We couldn't get him on the line. Why? What? What's going on? It's because we're not ambitious enough, and this is the thing. We're, we're, we're a big club, but the owners don't think, as, as a big club, the thing is a, is a smaller club, which don't get us on. We aren't a smaller club. We are a big club, but the owners think small. You're not just thinking they're not qualified enough. Yeah, well, this is it. You know, Lee Charnley, I mean, he's this guy who probably just jumps out the closet. You know, he said, oh, you know, welcome to Newcastle. You know, this is who we've got. He has absolutely no idea. You know, you've only got to look back at, at Dennis Wise as well when he came in. You know, in the pre, when he pre Ashley era when he when he just managed to own the football club. Just say, um, yeah, I just don't think we've got the right uh, guy that's going to try and negotiate deals for Newcastle. It's been a problem not just this window, not just the summer, but in previous windows. And a lot of players like to say, oh, I want a bit more ambition. I want a bit more know-how of where I stand with with the club I'm signing for. If that takeover does happen, what would you do with the board? Would you sack them all? Yes, you'd have to sack the whole board. Yes, you'd have to have a... Including Bobby Monko? Mm, that's a tough one. Uh, I know James mentioned it last night on uh, fan cams. I was a little bit taken aback by that a little bit. I think I'll keep him in, uh, but give him a, a different role within the club, if you get what I mean. You can't just like, kick out a legend at the football club. You know, He's been given a job to do. Yes, it might not I'll be... What, what tell you what I would do also, is i bring a lot of the ex-players back involved in the club, because that's something that we don't have that connection. You know, Shira's very, very distant from the club. You talk about even just not even that. It could be like ex players, like your locals, like Steve Howie, Steve, uh, Steve Watson. I know he's Gator manager, but you get the get the general idea is that we don't have any local. I mean, John Berryford, he's probably the only one or two people that I know who has still with a connection with the club, and there's not many. And it's a, it's a crying shame that ex players don't even want to have nothing to do with it because of the board. Well, this is the distance between Mike Ashley and the fans. You know, the fans don't feel the same as what the owner does, and the owner just obviously doesn't like. We, of course, we all know that. You know, for, for the things that we've said in the past. But you know, we are a one-club city. You know, we are a club that we stand by. We stand by who who we're backing, and that that's the players on the pitch. Um, 
the structure at the club isn't there and it's frustrating because as Newcastle fans, you know, we, we want to win things, you know, we want to show ambition. We don't want to be that club that are lurking at the bottom of the Premier League. You know, we are too big to be at the bottom of the Premier League and I'll echo that right now. We are a club that should be in that top ten, you know, battling for at least the Europa League. You know, we should be in the, the quarterfinals of the League Cup, the FA Cup, at least be, you know, making the odd appearance at Wembley. But yeah, I totally echo what you said about ex legends, you know, ex players that have been at the football club. There's no real connection at the club and that's very disappointing and the fans can echo that as well. I think there's got to be a lot more done at the football club to bring those sort of guys back that's going to move Newcastle forward because without the identity, without the fans, the club are not anything really. Spot on, I have to agree with you. So that leaves us nicely on to Rafa Benitez's future. Well, for me, I just we don't know. You just don't know what's going to happen with Rafa because is he? Yeah, I know he's got the connection with the fans He never want to hurt us, so to speak. I know that sounds like it's like a love story. Um, but he wouldn't like he wouldn't just walk out in the middle of the season I think he would at least stick it to the end of the season and he just again this all links in with, with the current board the takeover I think all three of them are linked I know that Amanda Stavely if she does come in wants Rafa to be there to take the club on to the next push that on to the next level we believe that's what she wants if Mike Ashley's there what happens if Rafa in the future Sharky what happens there if Mike Ashley's still there well it's simple really if Mike Ashley is there in the summer He'll want money and he'll want big money. And if he doesn't get what he wants, he'll be away. I don't see why Rafa Benitez, with his pedigree, the things that he's won, the clubs that he's been at, why he'd want to stay at Newcastle. And that's no disrespect to anybody listening right now. You know, all Newcastle fans will will know what I'm talking about. I think, you know, Rafa Benitez doesn't like to hang around. Uh, yes, it didn't quite work out for him at Liverpool, but he did win, you know, a Champions League and other cups in between because Liverpool have already got a good team. We do not have the team that they've got. But I think for Rafa Benitez... The summer's going to be huge. I think he will stay between now and the end of the season because he'll be dignified to try and keep Newcastle in the Premier League. If we stay up, then there'll be talks about money and potential movements going into the next Premier League campaign. But if we get relegated, I'm sorry to say, but I can't see him staying. I mean, he, for, for one, he's got relegation on his CV if we go down. And secondly, his, his job's done at Newcastle. You know, there's not a lot more we could do with the squad that we've got and the money that we're, we're spending. Yeah, but then some people might say you wouldn't want that on his CV either, a relegation. So it's... It's tricky, and Rafa plays the media well. Uh, whatever you think of your thing, his legend, I think he does play the media very, very well. Um, we'll have to see on that one, see how that goes in the future, because it's against all three of those linked. So we're going to come off that, and we'll just talk about you know transfers this month, players that we're not going to talk about every single uh, every single player. We're going to talk about the big ones that have made the headlines the last probably week. So we'll start with Kennedy. You know, um, seeing him come in. Personally, I didn't really understand why. We're going for Kennedy because I kept saying striker, you've got to have a striker, you've got to have a striker. That's all I kept saying. And it's like raising eyebrows, it goes, okay, so is he coming in for cover for Paul Dummett, we all thought? Is he coming from wing back? Is what's going to happen with Rolanda Aaron? Just to touch upon Rolanda Aaron shortly. Um, were you excited when Kennedy come in? Um, I, don't, I don't know. It, it, it was hard to judge, really, because I hadn't really seen much of him. I'd only watched him in the, in the FA Cup game against uh, Norwich City. He did look very lively. You know, he's rarely played for Chelsea, but he's a Brazilian. We've, you know, we've not really had a Brazilian at Newcastle since, I think, is it Meridinha? I think that's it. Claudio Casapa. Yeah. Players like that, I think he has got real potential. He's, got, he's a real talent. Yes, everybody talks about how we need a striker, but we all know that Rafa Benitez, at the same time, is a defensive coach. He's very defensive. He will get back and help you out, but at the same time, he will get forward and you've seen that with for Chelsea when he's played he can also be an attacking threat and that's what we need and that's what Rafa wants he wants to be able to mix it around a little bit and you want a player that can do both roles well I think a loan is probably good for him as well um, you know he can dream I don't think he'll go to the World Cup mind you, but he can dream I mean his debut on a Wednesday night against Burnley was absolutely unreal very surprised to see him start I thought he'll come on play 15-20 minutes and then what a debut was he won with a penalty he hit the woodwork he got an assist as well it just needed that goal didn't he from us and absolutely should, should have had the goal should have had the goal it was an absolutely brilliant display and i was very surprised and quite pleased actually that he started to be fair when i seen it, it was like bloody hell it was his, it was his kid but the thing is his consistency can he keep it up can he do it for the rest of the season can he do it funny enough to wait to a dodgy ground on sunday at crystal palace you know because it's not the classic could be wet or rainy all sorts um I think alone is safe, and then if he likes it and we fall in love with him and he falls in love with us, we can permanently sign him, because we've got a good relationship, Rafa knows it, you've got Chris Natsu who's another one as well. Um, do you think this is a safe option? Yeah, I would say so, because looking at the Burnley game last night, 
if only he was given the penalty score at the Gallagher, you know, that would have upped his confidence a bit more and you never know what could have went on from there. But he looked really lively against Burnley, was causing them problems. Uh, Rafa had him going attacking, which was quite surprising. The fact he'd even started, I think that did surprise a lot of uh, Newcastle fans because we were, we were all thinking that he was going to maybe get, you know, 15, 20 minutes of the second half. But you could only think that yesterday at Burnley, when this comes out, that, that would have done the world a good going into the, you know, going into the Crystal Palace game on Sunday and just hope that he gets maybe a full 90 minutes or, you know, what he did against uh, Burnley, similar sort of like timing, that he could pull off, the, the, you know, some more performances like that because against Chelsea, for Chelsea, shall I say, he wasn't really getting the dick game time, but he knows at Newcastle, he, he said all the right things, he done all the right things yesterday on the pitch and the lad can only push on and get better from there. Yeah, so it's a, it's a no risk. I mean, that one, I wasn't... I was on the fence of it. I was like, oh, okay, we've got yeah, a body yeah, for the door. But I think it was an upgrade from the fourth choice strike at Rolanda Aarons, which we'll touch upon him shortly. So Kennedy through the door, great. We've got one in. They're thinking, right, okay, Newcastle now going to go and kick on and get, you know, maybe one or two more through the door. And the next one was Nikolai Jorgensen was the big story over the one in January we didn't get. This rumbled on for about seven days. So initially went in. There was talk that who was this, who was this mystery striker, and the press couldn't get hold of it for about two days. And then they did, and it was Jorgensen. First bid got rejected, the second bid was rejected, and it just Newcastle didn't cough up enough. Allegedly, I have to stress what the reports were saying that it's up to 20 million euros. Newcastle wouldn't budge. I remember Giovanni Van Bronckhorst coming out and saying, "Look, he wants to go to Newcastle. However, uh, the situation is at the moment he's not leaving until they meet." whatever the board say and it just shows you again Charlie going back to the board the lack of effort to get the striker in which Rafa wanted and he's let he's been let down Rafa Benitez yeah I totally echo that I think 15 million is what Newcastle offered not quite smashing with transfer records then final wanted 20 million pound why didn't we just go out and spend the extra 5 million pound and go and get him for 20 million pound smash with transfer record no disrespect you see little clubs like Bournemouth Watford teams like that for example you know, breaking the transfer records Newcastle haven't done that since Michael Owen you know, for, 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 it was over a decade now, and it's an absolutely, it's an absolute embarrassment. It's a joke, and uh, at the end of the day, it's not fair, you know, because we're getting the, the fans through the gates, 52,000 fans for a club of our size. And I don't want to sound like I'm being deluded here, but we should be spending, you know, even up to 40, 50 million pound on players because that's the sort of club we are. That's the sort of ambition that we should be setting, you know, for for the crowd that we get, you know, for the ambition that we have away from home, for the stature of this football club, and for where it should be. You know, only getting loan deals in. It's shocking and that just goes to show a backward step in Newcastle's progression. You've only got to look back at the two relegations, you know, managers that haven't been good enough, players that were spent in the past that haven't been good enough. Jorgensen, very yes, okay, unproven, done very well in the in the Dutch league. But at the end of the day, if you gave him an opportunity in the Premier League, you just never know. And this is the most disappointing thing is that we didn't cough up the five million pounds that might have been enough to you know smash the transfer record and get him through the door. Whether you rate him or not the thing is with me is the board again the lack of ambition shown if you can't afford the money and it's not there we know that Mike Ashley's not ploughing money in the club which is a pain in the backside we're relying heavily on the likes of BT and Sky money to come in and fund the club which you know if that ever went bust we're screwed um, well football would be screwed and total it would be so for me it's just the boards if they're haggling over 5 million if that's what it was surely they can do instalments you know and pay bits and parts you know well, if they can get Hoslu at the start of the season for £5 million from Stoke City, better man, I don't think Hoslu's had a great season for Newcastle. If I held off him and just didn't get him through the door, that would have had Jorgensen in, in January. Look at it that way. You know, Hoslu hasn't exactly done a great deal for Newcastle, but that £5 million for Hoslu, if you bought him for Jorgensen, Jorgensen, might, he's, a, he's a younger lad, a Danish lad, and he might have actually been able to get you the goals that you know that could keep you in the Premier League. I think Rafa was just desperate to have a striker in in August or one, so that'll, uh, I guess, defeat the object, I think. Right, OK, so that went on. And then we're thinking, is it going to happen? Is it not? And then we went in for Daniel Sturridge because the deal for um, Nikolai Jorgensen was practically over. And we've seen Jorgensen play um, on deadline, deadline day as well. I've just seen someone crash into a pole. <laughs> right, we're just, in, we're just in Starbucks at the minute in the tune. <laughs> Someone's just crashed into a pole. Right, OK, and so coming off that, so Daniel Sturridge, I was, as you know, um, Shorty, I was visibly quite upset about it. Someone who I've always wanted to have for the door, I think. If he was to come in, he just brings a different set of strike out of hearts because he's ruthless. And I don't think him thinking of himself is such a bad thing. Some players, some some players don't suit it, but Sturridge will shoot on sight for himself rather than pass it. And I don't think that's a bad thing. He's greedy, and you know he's a natural finisher. I know he's got his injury problems, but 
ironically has been fit all season he's barely kicked the ball for Liverpool so when he when he when he was coming up to us and it looked like he was coming up and then Alan Pardew steps in somehow convinces him to go to West Brom who play long football play it in a three quarter full Hawthorns and go play his football there now I know his family's local but when you're turning down Newcastle United to go to West Brom to further your development that is something seriously wrong well, again, it all goes back down to the board, doesn't it? It's the, the ambition of the board. If the board aren't willing to, to stump up the money, like for the Yogurton deal, what makes you think we're going to get Sturridge? And even Sturridge even said that he wants a, a club with a bit more ambition, a bit more leadership. Uh, yeah, we've been Pardew by Alan Pardew, who's not really at the football club. And uh, I totally get why he's gone to West Brom for the family reasons, but at the same time, 52,000 fans every week? Really? You know, 4,000 away? Could be, good. could be God, could be worship. Okay. But this is just what I was about to say. You know, if he goes to St James's Park and he hits the ground running, providing he doesn't get any injuries, which he is injury prone, he could be a hero up here. You know, he could be the next. He, he could have been the God to Christian, to Islam, you know, all, all, and Mohammed, to all the people that we've got at the club. Exactly, all, all, these, uh, all, you know, all these faith names, you know. But, you know, in all seriousness, you know, Daniel Sturridge is a really good footballer and I was very gutted that the fact we'd, we missed out on him. Uh, apparently a deal was was lined up. You know that Newcastle would pay. You know 120,000 a week. It was all wrapped up, and then yeah, just to find out West Brom before as well. But prepared, I think it was desperation kicking in me because we didn't get Jorgensen. Rafa's panicking. Look, we need a striker. We'll get him over the line for me. Get me, get him over the line. The board didn't again. Yeah, I can do what what you've just said there, Lee. I think after when we didn't get Daniel Sturridge, to, this is towards the back end of the window. This is where the panic started to kick in. It definitely did, and we didn't get him. And well, he joined the baggies, and it's just a joke. So. That was the day before deadline day, and then deadline day, we're playing Burnley, which is just a joke in any case. The FA and the Premier League need to seriously look at that in the future. You can't be playing football when there's transfers happening. And, and on the on the pitch, yes, you're professional, but off the pitch, the club are nowhere. They're doing deals left, right, and centre, and you can't really focus on the two. So well, let's talk about the players on deadline day. We're going to just run you through a rattle off. Um, Jack Holback, you know, we've seen him a couple of times in the 23s. Barely kicked the kicked the ball for them. Never mind the first team was. No, I'd have seen that. <laughs> was, you know, he was offered a way out by a couple of clubs in the summer, and again, reports say that he didn't want to go because of location. And then he's been stuck in the reserves, picking up his 40 or 50k, whatever he's on, a week. And I think you had to get out, no matter what club it was, otherwise, his career's going down the pan. Is that a good move for him going to Forest? Yes, it's a good move for Jack Colback. The championship is probably about his level. But what I will say is, I think it's a little bit disrespect to Hull City. I think Hull City are a really good club. You know, they're only down the road, really, from Newcastle. Uh, they put a bid in for him in the summer. And he's, he's only a few hours down the road. He's going to be playing championship football for Hull City. A team that's just come from the Premier League. A potential of going back up to the Premier League. Yes, it hasn't quite worked out for them this season. Got to imagine Nigel, Nigel Adkins. And the same thing's happened with Rolanda Aarons, which we'll talk about later on. But Nottingham Forest, yeah, again, big club. You know, massive tradition. Um doing all right you probably yes guys both in the background so I apologise about that but overall I think it's it's a good move for him but if he's, if he gets the game time we'll see I think will the, will the fork out the transfer thing keep carrying on them paying them wages we'll see or you, I think it's a good thing for him because he needs to bugger off out of the club whether I don't don't rate him as a player no, but no. don't hate him as a human but for his own development quite similar to Mitrovic which I'll touch upon in a second he just had to get out and play football so we'll see how Jack Colback goes for Forrest I mean there was talk with Leeds Leeds is only an hour, now and what, now and a bit drive. Just, yeah, yeah, hold up I think um, Vernon, no, no, Vernon, no, no, and Nita, no. Vernon and Nita still lives up this way and he drives down, so it's not far. Um, moving off that, we've seen Freddie Woodman, who was named on the bench against Burnley, then shifted out straight back out and loan to Aberdeen. Aberdeen are predominantly, traditionally known as the third best side in Scotland. I think this is a good move for him. Um, I think the Championship is a higher standard than the Scottish Premier League. I'd like to see him go there. But at least he's got out shortly for me. He's getting the first team football. You know, he's rotated quite a lot in the under 23s because all like Nathan Harker and Paul Wollstone, I know he's went out alone, but all the under 23 goalkeepers do get rotated a bit. And he is potentially, fingers crossed, a future Newcastle one and England number one. And he's got to go out and play. And that all de- depend on the Dubrovka deal coming in, won't it? Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. I think for Freddie Woodman's development, he needs games. In Newcastle, he's not really getting the games at the moment because, you know, you've got Carl Darlow, you've got Rob Elliott, and you've potentially got the new goalkeeper coming in, uh, Martin Dubrovka. I think as much as the Scottish League, we call it the public these days, he needs games. He needs to be playing against the likes of, you know, Celtic, Aberdeen. You know, you need to be witnessing these sort of games to, to get a bit more experience because just sitting on Newcastle's uh, reserve bench is no good for him. 
and you know he won the World Cup for England in, in his you know in his age bracket. But the lad's got real potential. But I just don't think at the moment he's quite ready for the first team. But going to Scotland will do no harm at all. Yeah, hopefully he kicks on. There was talk that Celtic were going to come in for him because the next of, uh, Gordon was um, he's in jail for a couple of months, didn't he? So come off Freddie, we've seen uh, Jamie Sterry, who we've seen a lot of. Um, in the 23s, he's joined Dan Barlaza down and crew. Again, um, I think he's no disrespect to him, I think he's quite a bit way off the first team. I know he's a local lad, he's a Geordie, and we want him to do well. But again, it's, it's probably the same. He needs first team games now, doesn't he? Very similar to Freddie Woodman. He needs the games, he needs to be going there and experiencing League One football. You know, there's some good teams in League One, you know, that he'll be playing against, and it's good competition for him. You know, you look at the likes of Adam Armstrong, who've, who's won it on loan again. He needs the game times because, like you say, there's there's no good for him sitting on the bench, you know, waiting for a game because he's so far off the first team. And if he wants to develop his game, you need to go out and play first team regular football. And in League One, he's going to get that week in week out. You know, this this Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, and I think he needs that for his development. Okay, so carrying on the theme, another loan out. There's a there's a there's a trend happening here, people. Henri Savier was seeing him. He was uh, flew over to Turkey on the day. It was on the 30th, on the Tuesday. And then on deadline day, he went to Siversport, signed on loan for the rest of the season. Um, again, it's one of them, he's, he's, he hasn't got a future. I know he's played a couple of games this year in the Cup and that. And one that surprised start at West Ham. But his future's away from the club. The, the quicker we can get a fee, the better, I think. I mean, he's had one decent game, or a couple of decent games for Newcastle. He scored against West Ham. Yes, he made the mistake, but... All in all, we've not really seen a great deal of him. Probably no, no fault of his own, Rafa Benitez just doesn't see him at the future as Newcastle. Uh, going away on loan to Turkey you know, to the end of the season, that's come to no shock. Like you say, he hasn't really got a future at Newcastle. It's a bit of a shame, really, because you like to see everyone be given a real chance you know, to, to show what they're really about. But I think in terms of the future going forward, I think it's probably the right move for him. And then I think beyond that, the, the club will talk further with Saive and his agents, and then they'll just go from there. But... Again, he needs first-team football. Similar to callback, and they both need it shifted out. Alexander Mitrovic, this one always causes a, a, a split, a divided opinion. I know what you think of him, Sharky, but, um, you know, Mitrovic, it's one of those, isn't it? A lot of people say, is he better than Hoslow? I don't think he's any worse. Can't be any worse, but whatever, for whatever reason, Rafa just doesn't fancy it. We're not going to talk about why. You look, look, he's went... So what's happened on deadline day is um, he was going to go to uh, Brussels. He, he flew over to Brussels. For whatever reason, Andlek couldn't sell one of their players to raise the funds to pay his wages for the rest of the season. But then that broke down. So during the match, it broke down. But then we learned that Fulham flew their officials out to Belgium. So they must have been really keen to get him, to get him on loan. And they signed him. And I was, I was quite surprised. He dropped a division, mind. But he's Serbia's first choice. He's seen as a bit of an idol over there. He needs, again, first-team football in particular for him because it's World Cup year and again unfortunately his future is away from the club again it's he's probably a championship striker at the best you know he's not really had the, the game time in the Premier League he has had a few faults you know with Rafa Benitez this season you know you've only got to look at the uh, West Ham game you know when he, when he had the, the elbow and you know, we were winning 3-0 it was a comfortable game he had his opportunity to try and stamp his authority in the Newcastle team he scored as well but once that was found out and it was all over the TV that's it he never really made much of an appearance ever again um, for me he, when he first signed for Newcastle, he looked decent. He scored the goals, a few goals to keep him in the Premier League. Do you think he'll do well in the, for Fulham? I really do. I think Fulham fans, I was, I was uh, watching a lot of YouTube. I think it was Fulham fan TV. They were very keen on him. I think they really like him because he's one of those players where he's very strong, physical. He can keep a hold of the ball. He can pick out a pass. You know, and they've got a, a couple of decent forwards there, Fulham. You know, they've got a really pacey team that likes a camera. You know, they've got um, Tom Sessegnon, Tom Kearney. And I think it'll do the world a good. You know, Fulham as well are chasing the playoffs again this season. You know, they've picked up a good bit of form. And if Alexander Mitrovic can get a promotion with Fulham, it can cap off what's been a really mixed season for him. And it will do the world a good as well if Fulham go up. Or even if they don't, that he's getting regular game time, he's scoring goals, and it's going to help him when it comes to the uh, World Cup uh, when he's obviously playing for Serbia. I think also if he does well at Fulham, he'll have plenty of suitable suitors who will want him. So whether he joins Fulham permanently or he joins again abroad, I think, again, unfortunately, I, I do like Mitrovic. I don't think he's any worse than Hoslu. I just think, again, Rafa, once Rafa tells you you've not any plans, that's it. You look at uh, Colback and Savia, as we touched upon, the future's away. And then the final one, which I don't think Rafa really rates him, but I think what helps Roland Aaron is he's got age on his side. Now, it is, it's a brave, very brave move. You don't see English talent ever move abroad. It's very rare, especially in one of the big 
three or four leagues like the Bundesliga, Serie A, La Liga. But he's gone to Serie A. We know that he's probably got him because of Fabio Peccia and Rafa's done him a favour. But that's quite a bold statement to go and play in Italy's top flight because he doesn't speak the language, he doesn't know anybody. It's quite a big move for a minute. It is a brave move, but at the same time, I'm a bit disappointed for him that he didn't stay in the UK because Hull City again, a bit like... Jack Cole back at the start of the summer, put a bid in for him. You know, Nigel Atkins, I know how well of a good manager he is. Uh, he's doing a great job at Southampton. Uh, you know, he's a well-respected manager. He He's very good at getting the best out of young talent. And he's a young lad, he's, a, he's from the area. And again, it's, it's only a few hours down the road. And you look at Hull City, yes, they're not exactly having the best season in the Championship, but he's starting to turn them around a little bit. And he's working with the young players. And I think if he can fit into Hull's team, and they can start scoring goals again, you know, he's going to make a big, even a bigger name for himself. And if Rafa Benitez does want to sell him in the summer, and if he makes a big name for himself in the championship, we could get a, potentially get a good offer in the, for, from a championship club or from a bottom end Premier League club that we, we, can't, we can't really refuse. But by going to Italy, yes, it's a, it's a brave move. But at the same time, really. Because the Italian game is so slow, but he's not like, he's the opposite. He's like blistering with pace. It could be a good thing for him as well. I think. He's got a couple of off-field problems. We know about his um, assault case that's still going on with court. You know he's got a little in um, with his ex-partner who loves Twitter, by the way. She's read her Twitter feeds, hammers him. Um, so his personal life is kind of in public at the minute. In a, maybe just a fresh start somewhere else, even if it's just temporary, just a week kickstart his career. Could be, that could be one to watch out for. I'm, I'm quite I'm intrigued by that one. That's one I'm keeping an eye on for that one in particular to see how he gets on. And then we're going to talk about finally the, the the two players that were actually got in on deadline day. So the first one is the uh, goalkeeper, which is uh, Martin Dubrovka. I'm not going to lie, I don't know anything about him. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, he's good at this. I, I did say, I did read in his interview today that he's good with his feet, which will be very interesting if he's, good, if he's got good distribution. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, he has, because I don't know much about him. But I know your thoughts on the shot. We'll get to you in a second. But is he going to be third choice? Is he going to be there to challenge? You know, Darlow and Elliot. I know Rafa Benitez wants a goalkeeper. You don't have to be the best shot stop in the world, but as long as you can get the ball out quickly and fast, you're, you're going to play. And that's why he's been linked to, in the past, Pepe Reina heavily. Um, it's an interesting one. Coming on loan from the Czech League, I think that's a uh, warning sign there. It's a bit dodgy for me. Um, however, you've got to trust Rafa. Some, most of his buys, not all of them, we've seen Martel's, most of his buys have been good. This is again, I guess, we're not losing anything because it's a loan. If he's and if he's awful, then great, we're not we're not stuck with him. But if we do, if he doesn't press, we can then go out and buy him. And it's it is rumour that it's going to be under five million if we do buy him, which is now for goalkeeper. Twenty nine, he's at that right age. Goalkeeper start a peak. So there's there's pros and cons to it. Um, I'm sitting on the fence with this one, but I know you think he's going to be first choice, don't you? Yeah, I believe so. I think he's going to be first choice goalkeeper because we all know that Rafa Benitez isn't as strong fan of either Darlow or Elliot he keeps mixing them around a little bit you know you see Elliot play a few games and then Darlow play a few games vice versa it'll happen again now he wouldn't have signed Martin Dubrovka for six months if he's not going to be first choice or if he's not going to get any games because we're out the FA Cup we're out the League Cup there's only league, league games now I think he will make his debut at Selhurst Park on Sunday I think that's the, the best thing to do and Carl Darlow's mistake for Bernie's equaliser that's really shot his confidence and that's really just put him straight in, into the first team and um, hey, that didn't surprise me. No, no, yeah. because Darlow can do like two great games and do something like that. But again, I'm not going to sit here and say I know much about Martin Dubrovka. But from what I've seen on a few clips, don't I shouldn't always go by clips. But he looks decent. You've been YouTube scout, haven't you? Yeah, I actually have. I've been looking on YouTube, but. I've seen him in the uh, World Cup qualifiers because obviously they were in our group for England's you know World Cup qualifying, and he actually looked rather good. He kept a couple of clean sheets. Um, again, Rafa Benitez says that he's very good with his feet. You know, he's he's very good at like shot stopping and things like that. Now, again, Rafa Benitez likes his foreign goalkeepers. You know, you look at Pepe Reina at Liverpool. Uh, he, he he wants somebody different, someone who he can probably rely on. And Martin Dubrovka uh, must be that keeper because, again, we came in a couple of times for Sparta Prague and they said no. And then, obviously, on deadline day, we came in from. They've been looking for a replacement. So, why buy Martin Dubrovka for for six months and not play him? That wouldn't make any sense. I think it's only right that he goes straight into the into the first team. Then again, people will say that's allowed Freddie Woodman go out alone. So again, yeah. you can see both points are. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the final one is um, probably the biggest news is that we did actually get a strike out over the line. So the board actually pulled the finger out and done something. Um, Islam Slamani. Now there is joke going around that we've got Islam, we've got uh, Mohammed, we've got Christian, 
Uh, there's another one as well, which, I've, uh, which I'll come back to as but, um But, you know, looking at this, the thing is, he's a slight upgrade. I don't think he's like, wow, we've got him over the line. I'm not like that at all. I'm like, okay, he's better than what we've got. Will he score more goals than what we'll have if he plays the same amount of games? Yes. But it's just the board being the board, signing a ninja player, which is a bit ironic by the board. Can't play against Leicester right back because that's his parent club. So he's going to play a maximum of 10 games if he stays injury free. Scores four goals, I'll be happy with that. That's a good strike rate, four and ten, just under half. I'll take that. Uh, I think he's a little bit more. You can do what Hostler does, but I think you can run and turn as well, which Hostler cannot do. So I think it is an upgrade. Um, again, you can't really lose much if it's a loan. You pay two million loan fees for, for the rest of the season. If he bags in a few goals, great, we might sign him permanently, but... I'm, I'm, again, I'm on the fence of it because I'm not overly excited by the transfer window. What's your thoughts on Soleimani? Yeah, very similar thoughts because he came from, with a big reputation to Leicester City because he was doing so well for Sporting Lisbon in the Portuguese league. Again, Leicester City had won the Premier League and they wanted to do well in the Champions League and he, they all thought that he would be in that striker to try and kick him on in the Champions League. They'd done really well, but then the league form dipped you know, as they were doing well in the Champions League, finished middle of the table, didn't quite work out for him. Hasn't had games this season under quote club Powell. He's obviously sent him out on loan to Newcastle uh, to the end of the season. Again, if he scores anywhere between five plus goals, I'll be happy with that because he's only here for the remainder of the season. Uh, he's strong, powerful, physical. He'll give you everything. You know, if you put a, a, a set piece into the box, I'm sure he'll get his head into it. He's very good at like volleys. I've seen a couple of volleys like shots as well. So he'll offer something different. He's definitely better than Hosselu, but I think he's injured at the moment. But when he once he starts playing, I think we've not get we've not got to get on his back. We've just got to stick with him back him at the end of the season because he's a Newcastle player and until something happens after that then you can judge him at the end of the season but he's a Newcastle player let's just get behind the lad let's support the lad and give him everything and hopefully he can deliver it's not going to be a quick fix but with the right service hopefully he can get the goals along with everybody else to keep in the Premier League this season yeah that lad outside just fixed his bike people so uh, the final two things just to touch upon is uh, the first one is all these loan players shouting that have been loaned out. You, see, you can see the list in front of you that I've got there. Aarons, Mitrovic, Save, Sterry, Woodman, Callback, all loaned out on deadline day. That's a problem for me. Why can't we sell them? Why can't we find any suitors for them? Why aren't people putting up the cash for them? Or is it that these some of these players, in particular, Callback, Mitrovic, Save, those three are first senior players, you would say. I can understand the other three because they're youngsters. Are they, is it a case that they're not good enough big clubs don't want them or is it the wage is it the wages or the put off what is it why can't we get rid of them well we all know that it's it's hard these days to, to get players over the line it's Newcastle isn't it of course uh, we don't really do dealings very well unless it's Sissoko or something like that for, for a ridiculous amount of money um, I think we all know they're not good enough you know they're fringe players and a lot of them they call back you know they, they don't make the photo shoot these days they're not good enough but a lot of them will be on loan at the end of the season. I'm sure at the end of the season we'll, we'll get rid of them. If they, hopefully they do well, a lot of clubs will come in for them. Now, it's easier said than done getting players over the line these days. You know, you've got to look at this whole window. I think a lot of clubs are cautious in what they do. They don't just let it put, oh, let's bid £50 million for the strike and hope that they do well. It's best to get them on loan until the end of the season, then judge them at the end of the season, then buy them. And then if they're not good enough, you can send them back. Just like what we've done with Dubrovka and Salmani, if they're not good enough, you can send them back because we could say, well, oh, well, we've got them on loan at the end of the season. They weren't good enough. We've paid their wages. It's up to you to do what you want to do with them players. But I think it's not the case of not knowing what to do with them. I think it's clearly it safe for a lot of clubs. And, you know, you look at a lot of the championship clubs and Scottish clubs where these players have gone to, there's not a great deal of money uh, for a lot of those clubs. So I think they've played it safe in that sense. But then again, you can look at the board to think, why can't we negotiate these deals, with, especially with the likes of Callback, who, you know, doesn't get a look in these days. Saive has been a fringe player. Mitrovic has never seen a look in all season, so it's a bit of both, really. I think they're not good enough. Just, I'm just going to name you the clubs. Hellas Verona, Fulham, Siversport, Crewe, Aberdeen, Nottingham Forest. Not Nobody. one of them are anywhere near the Premier League or the standards of the Premier League for me. So, final question then before we wrap up. How would you summarise the whole of January transfer window, Sharky? Absolutely diabolical. That's it? Okay. Well, that was brief. I think it's poor. Um, what would you give it a rating out of 10? Uh, two or three. Not that bad. Uh, I would say two or three because we've signed some players, but if we just stopped with Kennedy or we didn't sign anybody, you just have to give it a zero because we've made no effort and the promises have been broken yet again. 
Yeah, I would score at low as well, probably around about three to four. I think, you know, I'm happy Freddie Woodman went out on loan. That's probably the one. Around Aaron's one, I'm intrigued about. The players coming in, I'm not really excited about, to be fair. Kennedy, yes, had a great debut. He needs to kick on. I'm very, very disappointed in the storage one didn't come. And I'm probably disappointed that they didn't go and splash the cash because nowadays all the, play the clubs around the Premier League are smashing their transfer record. We're, we're still a decade, 12, 12 years behind, you know. And we didn't go out and get Jorgensen. Whatever you think of Jorgensen, whatever you think, whether he's good or not, the club, the board, didn't do enough to get him over the line for the money. But that's been a podcast, a different kind of one. We normally do, like, matches and that. But we thought because Transfer Talk is so heavily dominated this week, we thought me and Troy would get one out there. Of course, 100% NUFC for his YouTube channel, Newcastle Fans TV as well. And if, you, if you're listening or if you're watching on YouTube, this is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Podomatic, and, of course, YouTube as well. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.